Hello, Rory Douse here from Cano Piano, and today we're going to be looking at Bach's Prelude in C minor. Cano Piano, cultivate, create, communicate. So this is an excellent little piece for developing your technique around about the intermediate level, and it goes a little something like this. And so on and so on. It's full of drama, it's full of pathos, and it's just a really, really fun piece to play. Now, it's one of these pieces that you can get a little bit um, um, tight and a little bit um, tense with, so you want to watch for that, but more on that to come. I'd recommend the first thing you do with this piece is play through everything just in block chords and really get used to the dynamics, the, the drama of the piece, and also the articulation. It's a very incisive sort of articulation, isn't it? Full of um, almost an agitato feel. Now Bach wouldn't have wrote agitato in, it's more of a romantic marking. But agitato means like agitated, A-G-I-T-A-T-O. If you want to write that in right now at the start of the score. And so um, that is a really, I think, you know, a good way to kind of bring some drama to the piece. But before we come to any of that, I want to get comfortable first of all, or I'd want to get comfortable with the chords. So to do that, you know, you want to re-familiarize yourself with the C minor scale if you're not already comfortable with that. This piece is in C minor, we've got three beats in a bar, and it goes a little something like this as block chords. We've got one, two, three, one, two, three, one. Is that right? Forgive me, it goes from there to here. Yeah, that changes a little bit with the left hand. And then here. Ooh, that's a lovely bit of dissonance. That's a G minor sus chord. We've got the sustained second degree there, the A, which then will resolve back down to the G. Very, very beautiful writing. Bach, the master of harmony. Here we've got this little passage which builds up. So going through the whole piece like that will give you a sense of the narrative. Well, what do I mean by narrative? Well, these chords don't all sound the same, do they? So, you know, if I just kind of play this through and it's just like... It's a bit banal, isn't it? Not particularly interesting. So every chord kind of has its place in the story. Just like when if you're telling a story, you might use a particular inflection on a certain word or vowel or syllable or, or whatever, just to kind of get that, that, that intensity well, so well placed. So that's what you know, we mean um, when we talk about tone, the tone of the piece. And how do, how do you go about that? Well, I think the first thing is just experiment and just get used to you know, where you feel the music's going, the musical direction, what the story, what the narrative maybe is, you know, invent your own story with it and just kind of think that and feel that it should go along, you'll communicate that to the audience and, you know, that's what they want after all. But the other way to go about it is a little more um, um, theoretical, formulaic, methodical, and it's just to use the phrase structure. So phrases then happen in four measures or four bars. Um, or eight bars and 16 and 32 and 64 and 128. You know, you can kind of ca compound the music out like that, where you get maybe like an eight bar phrase that's made of two four bar segments or measure segments. Well, what does that mean? Well, let, let me show you. Here's bar one or measure one. Uh, so one, two, three, two, two, three, three, two, three, four, two, three, five, two, three, six, two. Seven, two, three, eight, two, three. So that is like the first little little part of this music. 
Now, it may not always follow that really regular structure of like four or eight um, bars, measures. You know, you do get a regular structures, which um, we may find in this piece. But having that sense of like, where does, where's bar four? Where's bar eight in the music really allows you to structure it. Because what you want to do then to create that musical shape is start soft, get louder towards the middle, and then get softer again. So for example, here's soft, bar one, bar two, getting a little bit louder towards bar three, louder towards bar four, and then here is probably going to be the loudest point, bar five, and then here, we're starting somewhere new again, back to soft. So if that's something that you're not inherently aware of in, in your music, that is to say, you know, the phrase structure, it's something you probably want to mark in. And the way to do that, by the way, is just to take your pencil and draw these lines that look a little like slurs, but all the way over like the eight bars, eight measures. That will help you to see that. Here it is again, starting soft, being a little bit louder, getting louder still. Here's the middle point, so it's going to be the loudest point, the most tense point. And then here's the start of the new phrase, but it's going to be soft again. So hopefully that's coming across as expressive and kind of helping you build that structure. It works a little bit the same way that maybe like a sentence structure does, where you start maybe like a little bit lower and you get a little bit higher towards the middle and then towards the full stop you get lower again. Of course there's lots of variations on that, just like I kind of, you know, added almost like a question mark in the end, you can go up at the end. So there's lots of ways you can go about this, but that's a really good default. So with that in mind, the other consideration with dynamics is harmony. And I'm pretty sure it was C.P.E. Bach in his book, um, the, the Art of, of, of Keyboard Playing, that said that when it comes to um, distant harmonies, you know, ones that sound like, like the kind of clash, that they want to sound just a little bit stronger than the consonant or the sort of nicer harmonies. So at the start...